Welcome. And today we want to look at a very, very important topic. And that is why did Israel reject their Messiah? And this has some very important lessons for us today. So before we start, let's bow our heads and ask a blessing on the study. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you'll be with us as we open the Bible and examine this very important topic. Lord, we want to learn from the mistakes of the past so that we don't repeat them. So guide our thoughts and minds, Lord, as we try to understand why it is that Jesus was rejected when he came. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when Jesus came, he did amazing miracles. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. And you know, he even cared about the little things of life. For example, he fed a whole multitude when they were hungry after listening to him on the hills for some time. He fed a whole multitude with a little boy's lunch. And you know, his very first miracle was he provided the grape juice at a wedding. So Jesus was concerned about the little things of life. And we read in the Bible, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Absolutely wonderful. It would have been amazing to have been alive at that time and witnessed firsthand the wonderful miracles of Jesus. But when we come to the end of his ministry, we find this strange scene. We find this in Matthew chapter 27. Here was Pilate bringing Jesus before this multitude of people. And he says, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. Strange scene. Here was Jesus after three and a half years of ministry, doing wonderful works, healing people, raising the dead, teaching wonderful truths. And yet here was a whole multitude saying, execute him as a criminal. It goes on to say, and the governor said, why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more saying, let him be crucified. What a strange scene. Obviously, this was satanic hatred. And you know, the Bible has possibly the saddest verse here in John chapter 1. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. How can we understand this? We can partially understand maybe the world rejecting him, but here was his own people who'd been prepared by God to receive the Messiah, and they rejected him as well. You know, Paul wrote this in Romans, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So even Paul calls it a mystery how the Israelites were blinded. And we want to understand how it was that they became blinded so we don't repeat the same mistake. You know, there's an interesting comment from this Danish philosopher. He said there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. And the second one is really the tragedy of the New Testament. Wasn't that Satan brought along a deception and a delusion and the people received it, rather that the truth came and they believed it was a deception or they were told it was a deception. So to understand this, let's go back into the Bible and find out what was the expectation of the people in Jesus' day. You know, the people were expecting a Messiah who would make Israel a great nation again, who would remove the Romans, kick out the Romans, and make Israel a powerful, independent nation. And they would read the prophecies in the Old Testament that would seem to support this idea. For example, here we read in Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. 
And so they'd read these passages and say, there you go. When he comes, he's going to have control of the government. He'll sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. This will be a wonderful kingdom. And obviously, for this to be fulfilled, the Romans will have to be removed and will be a free nation again. Here's another prophecy they'd read. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Here we go, the Messiah once again. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And what would happen? It says she'll smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. See also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. And you can imagine the Israelites reading these saying, Yes, we can't wait for this Messiah to come. We're going to be exalted as a nation again. We're going to possess our enemies. This is what the Bible is saying. And you know, even the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 must have given them hope in that sense. You know this mighty image of the four different metals representing the different kingdoms? And the fourth kingdom, Rome, and here comes the stone down and hits the image. It says, Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. And the explanation is later in chapter 2. It says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And you can imagine the Jews saying, Yes, this is what we want. We want a kingdom that's going to conquer the nations of the world, make Israel the most powerful nation in the world. And they would read these prophecies with that mindset. We have some insights here from that book, Lift him up. It says the Jewish people were cherishing erroneous ideas. They were anticipating grand and wonderful things, hoping for their own personal exaltation above the nations of the earth at the Messiah's appearing. They were looking for the glory that will attend the second coming of Christ and overlooking the humiliation that would attend his first advent. Were there clues in the Bible that the Messiah would first come in humiliation? And the answer is yes. Passages such as Isaiah 53, even Daniel said the Messiah would be cut off. So there were enough clues there. Yet this idea was so entrenched in the Jewish people that even after the cross, when the disciples came to Jesus, this is after the resurrection, And they thought, now maybe he's going to restore the kingdom. We read this in Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? This is so entrenched. Even the disciples still cling to that idea. Here's an interesting quote from the book, Redemption. They thought the coming one would, at his appearing, assume kingly honours and by force of arms subdue the heathen nations and take the throne of David. Had they, with humble minds and spiritual discernment, studied the prophecies, they would not have been found in so great error as to overlook the prophecies which pointed to the first advent in humility and misapply those which spoke of his second coming with power and great glory. Interesting. And here's a very telling example here in the book Desire of Ages. It says they rejected their saviour because they longed for a conqueror who would give them temporal power. In other words, civil power. So let's try to understand the ways in which God was trying to wake up his people that the Messiah was about to come so they would have been receptive to Jesus' ministry and listened to what he had to say. What examples can we find of divine intervention that should have alerted the people that the Messiah was about to arrive? And an obvious one was Zacharias and Elizabeth. It says of these people, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now well stricken in years. So here's a a couple, a godly couple who feared God. They were righteous and blameless, it says. 
unfortunately they didn't have any children and in Israel that was considered a very tragic situation not to have offspring and they were beyond the time when they could bear children but you know God was about to do something miraculous here it says it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course according to the custom of the priest's office his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense so here's Zacharias about to do his ministration in the temple as was his order and there was a, a whole multitude, it says, praying without. So this, what was about to happen was going to be witnessed by a lot of people. Many witnesses there that day. And when he went into the temple, what happened? There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now what the angel was saying here was a prophecy which comes from Malachi. You can see the parallels here. In Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. God had prophesied, Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And now the angel was saying to Zacharias, The son that he would have would come in the spirit and power of Elias. And notice the parallel verse 6 in Malachi chapter 4 says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And that's exactly what Gabriel said to Zacharias, that the son of Zacharias would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, Zacharias struggled to believe this, because he was obviously old, his wife was old. And this was the response of the angel Gabriel. I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. And am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now here, the angel identifies himself as Gabriel. And that in itself should have been a little wake-up call, because Gabriel was first mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, in regard to to the 2,300 day prophecy and then later when the angel comes back to explain these prophecies to Daniel in chapter 9 again he identifies himself as Gabriel and chapter 9 of course was the prophecy giving the time of the Messiah's appearing so here's a little clue the angel that gave the prophecy of the Messiah's appearing was the same angel that came to announce to Zacharias that he would have a son who would be the forerunner of the Messiah. Now meanwhile, outside the temple, the people have been waiting and wondered, says they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. Wow, something had happened. So here's this great multitude outside about to witness something. They perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. And we're told in Desire of Ages how this is indicated. As he came forth from the holy place, his face was shining with the glory of God. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. Zacharias communicated to them what he had seen and heard. Now, how could he communicate? Well, obviously, we know he could use a writing tablet, and he must have explained what had happened. Now, that audience there, that congregation, that crowd, obviously witnessed 
Zacharias coming out with his face shining. This was a big wake-up call that God was about to do something amazing. Now, what else should have alerted the people if they had taken the time to inquire? And the answer is, Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, also received a visit from the angel Gabriel. And we find this in Luke chapter 1. It says, The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And what was the message from Gabriel? Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And of course we know the story. Mary went to visit Elizabeth. And it says it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And notice what she said in verse 43. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, she said the Lord was going to be the child of her cousin Mary. Now later it says, when Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, she brought forth a son. And her neighbours and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they all marvelled. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. So here's another miracle, him, his speech being restored. And notice the effect that this had. It says, And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now you'd think that people would start to make inquiries. Obviously there's a miraculous birth going on here. Would they have thought, is there something, is there a precedent being set here? Notice the biblical precedent we find here in the Old Testament scriptures. There's quite a number of barren women in the Bible who gave birth. Of course, we think of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah had been barren all her life and long past childbearing years at 90 years old. And yet she had Isaac, a child of promise. Another one was Samson, son of Manoah and his wife. And it says Manoah's wife was barren, Judges 13 verse 2. Yet an angel came to tell them they would have a baby. And this baby grew up to be a champion for Israel. So this was noised abroad. It says soon after the birth of the promised child, the father's tongue was loosed and he spake and praised God and fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And notice this. All this tended to call attention to the Messiah's coming, for which John was to prepare the way. But you know, here's a sad quote from the same book. The tidings of his birth and the wonderful significance of his mission had been spread abroad. Yet Jerusalem was not preparing to welcome her Redeemer. Why not? They should have been paying attention to what God was doing in this situation. What significant points should all have seen? One is that Zechariah, a righteous man, a priest ministering in the temple, is visited by an angel. And he comes out with his face shining, as witnessed by many people, many witnesses. The angel, Gabriel, is the same angel that was named in the scriptures, the one who brought the 70-week prophecy concerning the Messiah to the prophet Daniel. And the angel, the same angel, said that the child would fulfill Malachi's prophecy of the forerunner of the Messiah. And then, of course, there was a supernatural loss and regaining of Zacharias' speech. What else could they have learnt or picked up if they had made inquiries? 
Elizabeth could have told them about Mary's visit and how her baby had leapt in her womb at the sound of Mary's voice. She could have said Mary was also visited by the angel Gabriel. And she could have said that Mary was going to be the mother of my Lord. Yet there's no record of anybody making these inquiries. You know, there's a lesson here that we should do our homework, be diligent. When we hear something new, something significant, we should research it and look into it before making a rash decision. Now, what was another event that took place six months after the birth of Zacharias and Elizabeth's child that drew attention to Jesus? And of course, this was the visit of the angels to the shepherds. You might say, why shepherds? Well, here's a clue here. Had the leaders in Israel been true to their trust, they might have shared the joy of heralding the birth of Jesus. But now they are passed by. Notice that the angels passed by the leadership in Jerusalem to give the message to shepherds, farm workers, agricultural workers out in the fields. This is what we read in the Bible. And there were shepherds abiding in the field, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And then suddenly, the Bible tells us, there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And what effect did this have? We read this in Desire of Ages. The whole plain was lighted up with the bright shining of the hosts of God. The brightest picture ever beheld by human eyes remained in the memory of the shepherds. This was a big event. The whole plain was lit up by this angelic choir. Very significant. And it says, When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Now what other event after the shepherds was helping draw attention to Jesus? And there were two people in Jerusalem, godly people, one called Simeon, another called Anna. And so when they brought the child to the temple to dedicate him, this was a wake-up call to the people in the temple. It says, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. God had impressed him to go there. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, then he took him up in his arms and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And this drew attention to the priest. Notice this from Desire of Ages. To the astonished priest, Simeon appears like a man enraptured. Anna also, a prophetess, came in and confirmed Simeon's testimony concerning Christ. As Simeon spoke, her face lighted up with the glory of God, and she poured out her heartfelt thanks that she had been permitted to behold Christ the Lord. So this Anna, let's look at her for a moment. And she, Anna, was a widow of about four score and four years, in other words, 84 years old, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. So Anna told other people about this, that the Messiah was here. She had beheld him. Now what was the next major event that woke up Jerusalem? Well, it should have woken them up. It certainly caused a stir. And that was the visit of the wise men. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? 
for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now this caused quite a stir in Jerusalem. We read this in Desire of Ages. The arrival of the Magi was quickly noised throughout Jerusalem. Their strange errand created an excitement among the people which penetrated to the palace of King Herod. So the whole city heard about this and the the news of this got even to the palace of the king. It says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now, this is interesting. This drew attention to, again, the fact that the Messiah was born, these Gentiles coming from afar. But you know, they'd already heard the report of the shepherds. We read this also in Desire of Ages. The priests and elders were not as ignorant concerning the birth of Christ as they pretended. The report of the angel's visit to the shepherds had been brought to Jerusalem, but the rabbis had treated it as unworthy of their notice. Oh, here we go. Here was reports that angels had visited the shepherds. Not just one angel, but a whole choir lit up the whole plain. And yet they considered that unworthy of their notice. Why would that be? And we find the answer here. It says, Pride and envy closed the door against the light. If the reports brought by the shepherds and the wise men were credited... They would place the priests and rabbis in a most unenviable position, disproving their claim to be the exponents of the truth of God. It could not be, they said, that God had passed them by to communicate with ignorant shepherds or uncircumcised Gentiles. Can you see what's going on here? It was pride. They could not acknowledge that God had visited shepherds or given the light to Gentiles and pass them by. That would show them up that they were not the exponents of truth that they purported to be. That God had passed them by. You'd think they'd at least go and check it out. But you know what we read in Desire of Ages? It says they would not even go to Bethlehem to see whether these things were so. And they led the people to regard the interest in Jesus as a fanatical excitement. Here began the rejection of Christ by the priests and rabbis. From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Messiah. While God was opening the door to the Gentiles, the Jewish leaders were closing the doors to themselves. Wow. Now something took place that should have woken up the Jews as to the time they were living in. Herod, it says, sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. We read this in Matthew chapter 2. And this was a fulfillment of a prophecy from Jeremiah chapter 31. The prophecy said, talked about Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted because they were not. Rachel, of course, was buried just right next to Bethlehem. And so here was a prophecy about the slaying of the babies in Bethlehem when Herod was going to try to kill the Messiah. If they were discerning and good students of the Bible, they would have picked up a connection here. Now what happened in Jerusalem 12 years later that again drew attention to Jesus? And this was Jesus' visit to the temple at the age of 12. Remember the story how Jesus' parents thought Jesus was with their relatives and they started heading back to home and they got about a day's journey and they realized Jesus was not with them. So they headed back to Jerusalem and it says they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. He questioned these teachers in regard to the prophecies and to events then taking place that pointed to the advent of the Messiah. The rabbis spoke of the wonderful elevation which the Messiah's coming would bring to the Jewish nation. 
But Jesus presented the prophecy of Isaiah and asked him the meaning of those scriptures that point to the suffering and death of the Lamb of God. The doctors turned upon him with the questions and they were amazed at his answers. With the humility of a child, he repeated the words of scripture, giving them a depth of meaning that the wise men had not conceived of. If followed, the lines of truth he pointed out would have worked a reformation in the religion of the day. And when Jesus began his ministry, many would have been prepared to receive him. Wow, how sad. If they had followed what Jesus was revealing to them, it would have changed the mindset of the people. Very, very sad. And this verse here is so applicable. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Wow, if only they had thought through what the child Jesus had opened their understanding, opened their eyes to see, things would have been very different. What was the next major event regarding the Messiah? And that, of course, was John the Baptist beginning his ministry. It says, as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not, they wondered if John the Baptist was the Messiah. Did you know he responded to that and said this, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And obviously John the Baptist's ministry got back to Jerusalem. They heard about it and they sent down people to ask him, Who are you? And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is whose coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchets I am not worthy to unloose and then came the day when Jesus came down and John pointed him out behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world this is he of whom I said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me even though Jesus was younger than John he knew that Jesus had existed long before he was even born and then, of course, the major wake-up call was the ministry of Jesus himself. Jesus did so many undeniable miracles. This should have woken up the people that here was somebody led of God in amazing ways. But you know what the Bible tells us? But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Now, the leaders were not ignorant of Jesus' ministry. We read this. The success of Christ's work was reported also to the authorities at Jerusalem. The priests and rabbis had been jealous of John's influence as they saw the people leaving the synagogues and flocking to the wilderness. But here was one who had still greater power to attract the multitudes. Those leaders in Israel were not willing to say with John, He must increase, but I must decrease. They arose with a new determination to put an end to the work that was drawing the people away from them. What was the issue here? They liked the adoration of the crowds. And here was a person drawing the crowds to him, even more than John the Baptist. And so they opposed Jesus during his ministry. They bitterly fought. They spread false rumors against him. And what was the crowning miracle that should have woken them up that this really was the Messiah? And we find this in the story of Lazarus. Do you remember how Lazarus had died? Jesus had waited until he had been buried four days. No doubt the religious leaders were saying, well, when Jesus raised the dead, perhaps the person was just unconscious and they just they were in a coma or something and they came out of the coma but now here was a miracle. Here was a man who had been dead four days. In fact, started to decay when the women were nervous about rolling the stone away. 
and Jesus called him forth. They could not deny this miracle. And you know what they did? Instead of saying, okay, we can't deny this. We better reevaluate our assessment of this man. What did they do? The Bible tells us that day the Jewish leaders began planning to kill Jesus. And not only that, you read in the next chapter, the leading priests made plans to kill Lazarus too. Get rid of the evidence. Shocking. This is how, how darkened their minds had become when they set out to oppose Jesus' ministry. It says, Christ's miraculous power gave evidence that he was the Son of God. In the cities of Judah, overwhelming evidence was given of the divinity and mission of Christ. But prejudice is hard to deal with, even by him who was light and truth. And the prejudice that filled the hearts of the Jews would not allow them to accept the evidence given. With scorn, they rejected the claims of Christ. So sad. It was prejudice, unnecessary prejudice, built up against Jesus that caused him to reject the Son of God. Have a look at this quote here. When Christ was upon the earth, the people flocked to hear him. So simple and plain were his words that the most unlearned among the people could understand him. And his hearers listened as if spellbound. This enraged the scribes and Pharisees. They were filled with envy because the people listened so attentively to the words of this new teacher. They determined to break his hold upon the multitudes. They began by attacking his character, saying that he was born in sin and that he cast out devils through the prince of the devils. They'd become so prejudiced, so envious, that they began interpreting the works that Jesus did through the power of God as the work of the devil. That's blasphemy. Very, very sad. But that's what pride and prejudice and envy leads you to. You know, even Pilate, when the Jews delivered him up to him, knew what was going on. The Bible says Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. So here's a list of clues that should have woken up the Jews that the Messiah was here. Gabriel's visit to Zacharias and the miracle child they had, who was to be the forerunner. Elizabeth could testify that Gabriel had visited Mary, and Mary would become the mother of her Lord. Angels announcing the birth to the shepherds. The wise men coming to Jerusalem, saying the prophecy had been fulfilled. They'd seen his star. Then Jesus, the age of twelve, astonishing the learned wise men of Jerusalem. Then, of course, John the Baptist announcing the Messiah. And then Jesus' own ministry of three and a half years, all the miracles and proofs that he gave. And yet, despite all that God was doing to wake them up, prejudice and envy got in the way. You know, it says this in Second Thessalonians, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Brothers and sisters, we need to have a love for the truth. Whatever it may be, wherever it leads, don't let pride or envy or prejudice get in the way of receiving the truth of God. It's vital. It was the downfall of Israel, and it's going to be the downfall of many people today. You know that wonderful text in John 3.16, For God so loved the world? If you keep reading after that, we find this very interesting passage, which indicates why people will be condemned and lost in the future judgment. It says, This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness, rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Amazing. Once you go down the track of wanting to stay in darkness, rejecting the light, this is where you go. It says, All the people were amazed, and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 
they determined that his miracles were not of God, even though they were. Blindness, blindness, shocking, but that's the reality of what happened. And human nature hasn't changed. It's amazing. The fact that Jesus spoke the truth, and that with certainty was why he was not received by the Jewish leaders. It was the truth that offended these self-righteous men. The truth exposed the fallacy of error. It condemned their teaching and practice, and it was unwelcome. They would rather close their eyes to the truth than humble themselves to confess that they had been in error. Amazing. Too much pride. And that's what it led to. The sin of the scribes and Pharisees was the sin of placing the heavenly work which had been wrought before them in the darkness of unbelief. So that the evidence which should have led them into a settled faith was questioned. And the sacred things which should have been cherished were regarded as of no value. Now, why is this important for us? Because human nature has not changed. It's going to happen again in our day. Look at this quote here. As in Christ's day, the chief priests and rulers stirred up the people against him. So today, the religious leaders will excite bitterness and prejudice against the truth for this time. Nothing's changed. Human nature hasn't changed. And we're going to see the same prejudice, the same envy, the same pride rising up again and blocking people from understanding and seeing the light. Interesting statement here. When the Lord is about to do a work, Satan moves upon someone to object. I find this quite close to my heart because I've been sharing over the years some many wonderful discoveries that have been made confirming the Bible in the Middle East. Discoveries such as the Red Sea Crossing site, Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, the real Mount Sinai. And most people hear these things gladly, but there's always a core group of those who don't want to know, who shut their eyes, close their ears, and object about these wonderful truths being shared. They're repeating the same history, the history of the Jews. Very sad. You know, even today, when truth comes out, people ask, what are the qualifications of the speaker? Have a look at this quote here. The Lord often works where we least expect him. He surprises us by revealing his power through instruments of his own choice while he passes by the men to whom we have looked as those through whom light should come. God desires us to receive the truth upon its own merits because it is the truth. You know, Ron White, who was led to discover these things, has been his character has been besmirched Prejudice has got in the way, and it closes people's minds. It's very sad. We must learn not to let prejudice get in the way of discerning what the truth is. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jews, and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. O oh, brothers and sisters, don't fall into the same trap that the Jews fell into. Don't let prejudice get in the way of discerning the truth that God wants to lead us into in this time. The Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. We must prove everything. But if it's true, if it's genuine, then hold fast. We know Satan's going to have many delusions today. We know that. That's why it says, prove all things. And if it's good, hold fast onto it. This is vital. Let's close with a prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we don't want to repeat the history of the Jews. Guide us that we may be ready to discern the truth when it comes. Lord, don't let prejudice or envy or pride rise up in our hearts and close our minds to the truth that you want to reveal in these last days. Lord, we pray that we may not repeat the mistake of the Jews, but help us to be humble, receptive, students of your word 
that when light comes, we may be ready to accept whatever it is that you want to shed upon our path. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.